like all right what is up everybody um we're going live with tanner tatted just doing a simple q a podcast tanner how you doing doing good man doing good a little sick but hanging in there yeah what happened i have no idea <laughs> it's gonna be that uh, lately, man. gonna be flu season or something i think and so it came down with a little a little something yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I went all the way to Thailand and I was like expecting to come back with like the new COVID and nothing happened. I was like, cool, man. I'll wow, lucked out. Okay, yeah. nice. That's sick. The The worst thing that happened was like I ate too much food legitimately with like Steve and it was like I was still sick from that, but it was a good time, yeah. Yeah, I remember you telling me that. I think I asked you how the trip went. Your immediate answer was the food comment. Dude, oh my God, it is crazy. Like I... You know, like Steve's older, right? So I was thinking, all right, this dude, he's like, he probably is past like eating lots and lots of food to a point that he's like ill, right? And I was so wrong. Like, he's like, let's eat more. Let's eat more. And I'm like, dude, like, I've never seen anyone that can eat as much as me. And you're still putting back food. And he's like, all right, now the tactic is we wait an hour and then we'll go back up. And so we waited until the buffet closed to leave. And he was still getting plates when they were closing. Wow. I mean, we all probably had like 10, 12 plates. It was crazy, dude. I was like, what are we fucking doing? <laughs> and then he gave us um, light pace inhibitors. So we were like shitting lipids, like just straight fat after that. Dude. It was great. It was, it was a really interesting experience. And then like, Two days later, it was the flight home. So here I am on the flight, like shitting just straight fat up, you know? Wow. <laughs> just such a horrible situation. <laughs> he could have warned you at least, knowing that you yeah, had that no, you know, double digit flight back home. He, he could have told me definitely. He's like, just take these. They're going to fucking help you out so much. I'm like, cool, man. And then, like, before you know it, my, my ass is just leaking fat. <laughs> <It's> like, great. <laughs> uh, so much for harm mitigation. Yeah, that sucks yeah. there. <laughs> It was something. I guess it was like a form of harm mitigation because I didn't absorb the fat from the buffet. So there's that, but not for the people around me. Absolutely not. They probably <laughs> resulted a, a bit of harm from that. Um, so I'm curious, man. I got to ask, you know, Sam Solik has been like everywhere. He's been kind of the hot topic for the past several months now. And the, the dude is, I have to admit, killing it on the social media front and honestly doing so with much little efforts i mean it's like he, he was just got a camera he was recording on his iphone which is so impressive to me um immense like a massive following and probably the shortest amount of time i've ever seen and just kind of burst onto the scene i have a couple opinions about how he does things obviously he's pulling in a lot of the general population into his audience he's not like a die hard bodybuilder i wouldn't say but he is someone who's highly involved in bodybuilding and the methods applied. But he has a lot of practices that I personally maybe don't agree with and have had a lot of controversy uh, trying to explain this. What are your thoughts on him, on the things that he does from what you know, his diet, the potential gear use of, of him, uh, you know, and, and the, the side effects that are externally visible, at least for um, from my point of view. So I'll leave yeah. that up. I have a really interesting history with Sam. So I used to have my main TikTok. That was my main content source. I would post everything there. That got banned. But mm -hmm. at the time that I did make it and around the time I started it and started taking off, Sam and I were actually following each other. And so it was really nice to be able to have a couple conversations with him when he was just another TikToker and yeah. I didn't see him as anything crazy. I did say a couple times in, in conversations and he's a very tight lipped guy. He doesn't tend to say much back probably because he had a lot of people saying the same kind of thing to him. Sometimes he'll look at your message and just like it, even if you ask him a question and say nothing in response. Um, yeah. But getting that a little bit of context on him and knowing what he was kind of up to back then, I didn't get, you know, his full cycle or any of his numbers or anything like that, but he would drop some hints. That is really eye opening. I, I mean, I wonder what he's doing now, honestly, but yeah that's basically the context of the situation is that little bits here and there and all obviously out of respect for people i'm not gonna yeah. you know go running around public publicizing things unless it becomes like a liver king scenario that i have to pull <laughs> yeah. the vigorous steve card but right. hopefully it doesn't come to that um he's a very good guy and it manifests in his personality in his videos just like what you were saying how he doesn't exactly have a super nice camera the camera is not the necessity there. It's more the the content that he's delivering, the person that he's delivering to yeah. his viewers. 
and it is a religious response from the people who watch him mm -hmm. it's 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 insane honestly like if you speak against him it's the like man i've not had a video that was that i had probably like a thousand five hundred views on the reel when i put it out like it was a pretty quick response but the comments were like to per ratio of view it's insane like i had so many comments immediately just saying like you don't know what you're talking about like this is just sam you know and it's like all these crazy things i was like all right like mad respect the dude's nice like he's very humble you can tell he's very stoic and has like a way of navigating conversation and just kind of talking that is almost healing in a weird way or more maybe just like real he's very upfront and blunt and like real with people and talks about the shit. and i think people really connect with that um but me as a coach like just looking at it from a technical aspect that's kind of where i'm like maybe coming up with some of these conclusions that aren't so positive and people maybe don't see that as the most favorable favorable way of approaching him even though i don't mean it in any kind of dismarching way it's just like hey I, I think maybe this individual is practicing things that might not be useful do you think with like how he structures his diet or his training you know I, I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone's freely familiar with how he trains now like is there anything that you would think mm, i might revise that a little bit yeah honestly the diet is is one thing that's kind of been his viral claim to fame especially it was around the time that hostile brought him on mm -hmm. it was a uh, fuad and a couple other buddies buddies from uh, hostile getting out there documenting the whole diet that garnered a lot of negative attention warranted in some ways because it's impressive to see someone eat like that volume of food that kind of food and still maintain a pretty good body composition yeah. which speaks to how strong his metabolism is if anything does that speak to how healthy he is? Well, we, we've never seen his blood work. We don't exactly know what's going on under the hood. You would want to wonder about things like, you know, what's his cholesterol looking like with the with right. the kind of diet. Um, but I can't. It's it's hard for me to bring my own experiences into this equation because I know that everyone's body is so different. Right. But just because something works doesn't mean it's exactly the best way to go about getting there. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you could take a rowboat to thailand but taking a plane is probably the most efficient probably the safest way to get there yeah that's the way i'm looking at this situation yeah yeah and that's that makes a lot of sense um would you uh, kind of to play devil's advocate here would you let's say your your friend is like dude i'm ready to get into this like i'm stepping my game up i want to take this thing seriously i want to build a physique that garners so much attention possibly step on stage blah 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 would you say all right man like you're eating like you know let's say this individual's eating the donuts eating a gallon of milk a day like consuming very little whole foods in, in a diet and there is soul foods in there i don't want to say like he's not consuming whole foods yeah there is of course donuts. he's like yeah. you know, 12 donuts of krispy kreme and a gallon of milk a day or half a gallon is kind of where the things get whack but would you say to that individual like in the way he's training you know would you say mm, maybe we try a different route or would you kind of just let that that bullet fly until it hits a wall that's that's what's super interesting is I think that when someone has an impressive enough physique, they can use it almost like a get out of jail free card where, yeah. hey, it doesn't really matter what I'm doing. Like, look at me, like, you know, look at my followers, look at this, whatever. And then even their audiences will reflect the same thing where they say, oh, but like, look at how good he looks. He's amazing. He, he looks awesome. You could imagine someone who's the same age as Sam, maybe natural and somewhat different genetics, and they posted their full day of eating and it was the same as Sam's there would be a dramatically different response right. from the community. There would be insults at their physique, insults at their diet, like, you know, you're never going to make any progress. And then, you know, you bring in some enhancements or the genetics are a little bit different. And then when you have a finished product like Sam, the reaction is different. Mm -hmm. That's a really big issue. I think people are, are seeing the finished product as what is rationalizing all of the choices that lead to it instead of, the other way around where if you are looking for that finished product we should probably focus on these things first yeah yeah it's it's sort of like he's the exception and not the standard and I, yeah I've said this yeah, before. yeah he's he's so unique as an individual like it, it's like pointing at ronnie coleman saying well i need to you know squat eight plates and, and deadlift and like i need to to fucking press like 200 pound dumbbells every single day and and that's how you make progress and intangibly it's not right and i think this other it's not i guess it doesn't happen within our community as much maybe like people who have been in this community a while but when you have 
these online religious groups, so to speak, right, who follow him and various other influencers, their immediate reaction is like, oh, you're not as big as him. And, yeah. and I think <laughs> this is like kind of on the line of what you were saying is I don't think being as big as someone is a qualification to to say, you know, more or less than them um, or you have more or less experience because genetically it's such a continuum of progress that it's 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 a non-qualifying statement almost you know what i mean yeah. and it sucks because like you see these kids who have that belief of like sam is the guy who knows what's up because he is bigger than you and you won't ever be able to attain his physique so i'm not going to listen to you right but arguably um you know having listened to, to sam and he's a smart guy he really is but there's some things that i would know or you would know or steve would know or paul would know that maybe haven't even passed his mind yet as a, as a young 21 year old fairly. So it, it's, it's, a, what scares me about it is that, right. Is like the, um, you know, like the, the rapport he's building with the audience is based around a physique that gives him the speciality of knowing what he's talking about. Yeah. Whereas having a coaching company or having clients who are successful or something isn't necessarily the leverage that most people want to see. And so if you're not in the bodybuilding community, you see Sam is the guy who knows what's up versus the guy who's just talking that doesn't have a sick ripped physique at all times eating, you know, 12 Krispy Kreme donuts a day, unfortunately. So that's that's where in the educator space, it, it creates this interesting uh, line in the sand between, hey, so-and-so has an amazing physique, therefore they know what they're talking about. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe not. Or so-and-so has a lot of knowledge. This is awesome but they lack the physique, then there's a disconnect. Like, okay, well, how do I really trust this guy? He's not really that big. He's saying a lot of fun, big words, but does he mm -hmm. actually know how to apply his own knowledge? And so even as in this quote unquote educator space, I'm still really new to bodybuilding as a whole. I do get criticisms like that all the time. So I'm intimately yeah. familiar with it. And then there's the perfect storm where you have both from both sides. I think John Jewett is an amazing example of this where mm -hmm. He has proven himself as a bodybuilder. He has proven himself as an educator with J3U. If you were to say there's always a bigger fish in the sea, in Sam's case, sure, maybe he's bigger than you or me. Maybe he has a bigger following. But if you can hold John Jewett above Sam, there's really not any debates that could be had there. I mean, it, it's yeah. undeniably true that John, looking at Sam's situation, would probably have some similar opinions to us. And then, you know, the collective audience can defer to that. I, I think the the situation that you've described is exactly that, where people see the physique as, oh, this is the the credential. It's, it's a, I mean, honestly, what it boils down to is a, an appeal to authority, mm -hmm. which we've been intimately familiar with. I'm sure you have people say like, well, are you a doctor? Like, you know, what are your credentials, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I, and there, honestly, some precaution there is needed because sometimes there is that individual who, you know, I can think of a couple coaches that locally I know who just started training people and they they've not even been training themselves for six months, you know, and they're they're like talking about cycles that they would run and they just started anything. Right. And like, I know the guy who they bought it from kind of thing. And uh, it's you, sometimes the, the qualifying factor of does this man have a physique is arguably an important thing to ask. But when you, you like you said you kind of have to divide and and almost stratify like is he just having a physique or does he have an intellect that is sort of driven by both data yes and also the practical application of these yeah. things you know and, yeah. and it's it's um it's hard to find that and i think it is so easy because on the magazines on the youtubes like on everything you see the guy with the sick physique and you're like he has the answer and it's just, it tends not to be that way. I am curious with the way he, and I'm not even like sure, right? I don't even have an idea. I'm just curious with the way he does stay so lean and like he's been cutting for like six weeks and he's already shredded. Um, the the off season diet, he's eating a copious amount of food, uh, more food than I would argue like most bodybuilders are able to get away with. And he stays hyper, hyper lean. Do you think that's something he might be using or his genetic proclivity that's allowing him to be honestly like sub 10% or 10% body fat most of the year? Yeah. So the best place to, to kind of ground yourself is to look back at what he looked like when he was a natural. Mm -hmm. And you can see that he is 
basically skeletal lean. This was when mm -hmm. he was a diver. He would, you know, be competing there. You do need to be pretty lithe, pretty athletic, pretty graceful for that. And so the physique yeah. that that lends you to is very, very low body fat, uh, but yet still very rather strong muscles. Um, that was kind of the foundation of Sam. And I think ever since then, his body has lended itself to that shape. And all he's done is obviously ramp up the amount of muscle mass that he has. During all of his bulks, he stays rather lean. I think some of his earlier bulks, and I see this with like across the board anyways, some people's earlier bulks, they typically put on a lot more body fat. Oh, yeah. And then as they gradually get to a leaner and leaner state, they maintain that into their bulks. And then you'll see that with competitors too. They'll be like peak off season. They look like they could do guest posing or step on stage and do great. So yeah. that's kind of the way that I'm looking at it. With that being said, in my interactions with him, it doesn't seem like he's the kind of guy that has a lot of deep knowledge about enhancements. So if he was to be running some kind of mystery advanced, like stay lean during your bulk protocol, that would be a little bit shocking to me. Mm -hmm. Um, unless he has someone else that he's close with or he knows someone that's, that's helping him with all of this, but I don't think we have any indication that that's the case. Yeah, I don't, and I don't think so either. He doesn't seem like an individual who even, like the, the application of insulin, I'm not sure he would even know what he was doing there. I mean, yeah. and yeah. rightfully so. Again, he's, he's super duper, He, I believe, how, how old are you? You're 20, 23. 23, he's 21. So he's, he's younger than both of us. And I'd imagine that he doesn't know a lot of things yet. So his his drawer of special tools he can pull out is rather slim. And he probably doesn't have a lot to his knowledge base that he can use, which does, you know, call this a bit interesting. And I do think it is partly, mostly a genetic proclivity at the end of the day. And um, you realistically, again, that's kind of where it leads to most people who would try to do what he does would look absurdly different and would never achieve is like I could never even have the size of his shoulders. Like there's just no way it does. It won't happen. Um, but it, my a, another question I had along that same line is: Let's say you did have a client who was like, "Man, I really like Samsung is my fucking goal. Like that is who I want to look like." Obviously, realistically, this is case dependent, and most individuals are going to be able to look the best as they can, but not as another person can. Yeah. But what would you tell this person? Like a, a client asks, Hey, you know, what cycle could I run to be realistically the size of, or get to the size of Sam Solek? What would I need to do? Right? Yeah. Um, so for anyone looking at, at that level of muscle mass, we're talking like very high level classic or low level open, mm -hmm. then you're going to be looking at more than one cycle. There's not going to be one cycle that's going to make you look like that. So we can pretty easily rule out that misconception. Then you'd be talking, you'd be having the risk conversation essentially, where how much risk is it worth it for you? How much, how many sacrifices genuinely is this individual worthy, like willing to make yeah. in order for them to achieve that amount of muscle mass? And that might include conversations about fertility, conversations about hair loss, conversations about acne, all of these other side effects. And then you start getting into the more serious ones of your organ health, your time that may be limited on earth because yeah. of your choices here. If the answer is yes, 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 all the way down the line, and I have reason to believe that they're serious about saying yes to those things, because many people will offhandedly say yes until they actually start balding or their testicles actually shrink or, you know, yeah. Once, once these things actually happen, then all of a sudden they change their mind. Mm -hmm. But if, let's say, this hypothetical client is 100% in it, is like, this is my life, I'm going to do it, then we take the next step forward. So we say, all right, you're not going to get to his doses tomorrow. You need to earn those doses. Mm -hmm. So as your body gets bigger, as you adapt to the training, to the diet, you slowly start ramping things up. As far as I can say of like uh, compound selection, let's, let's say like for Sam... We know that he probably doesn't have super, super advanced training or advanced uh, enhancement knowledge. He's right. probably not using any exotics. He's probably just using some basic stuff. And he's built an incredible amount of mass. And a lot of that is relatively lean. Can take a shot in the dark, say that there's a lot of growth hormone involved in the physique mm -hmm. that he's built. It also lends itself to his really calm demeanor. I find that yeah. a lot of guys that are running pretty high growth hormone, they're just not really sleepy, super. but just always, you know, with the yeah. flow. Teddy I'd bear, say. yeah. Would you want to uh, toss your hat in the ring? Any ideas about if we're going to start theorizing cycles for him? Honestly, I think you're on the right line. My thought was exactly that. He probably doesn't know how to use insulin. He probably doesn't. I, I would imagine there's no way he's deploying IGF-1. And I could be wrong. But like, 
I, I realistically think it's a high dose of growth hormone. Yep. And when I say high, I usually leverage the eight to 10, 12 I use area for high. And I believe, like you said, he's probably not using an assortment of exotic compounds or testosterone derivatives. He's likely just using the basic stuff, testosterone, maybe equipoise. He, he has like a straight that I just find that that strange vascularity that he has is really lends itself to that equipoise look, if if you will. Um, and and that's probably it, like equipoise or maybe a DHC derivative like Mastron. And then when he's in his cutting phases, I wouldn't be surprised if he was using something like Trend, but not at the very high dose. He doesn't seem like the kind of guy that gets any sort of mental delusions that a lot of bodybuilders do experience at higher doses of Trend. So if he's using it, it might be the lower dose. Um, so I would imagine realistically, like throwing ballpark numbers out there, it would be a testosterone based cycle with likely anywhere from 500 milligrams to a gram of testosterone. Generally speaking with just his size, I would imagine it's somewhere around there. On top of that, you have a moderate dose of a DHT derivative, 250 to 500 milligrams, and then a large dose of growth hormone. And I really don't think he's going much beyond that as I see, like you mentioned, he has a very calm demeanor. The thing that makes me believe there's a higher dose of testosterone is his exorbitant acne development yep. in the yep. earlier YouTube videos that he had. And he started taking Accutane now, so it's not so bad. But usually that's a hallmark of like very high testosterone doses and not necessarily other compounds as specific as testosterone is. Yep, that is exactly what I would have commented on as well, is that the testosterone base that he's running is undoubtedly high mm -hmm. because of all the acne that he's experiencing, other things of that. So, I mean, the amount of size that he's put on. Yeah, you'll. Um, this is also a bit of a controversial topic, but especially when some bodybuilders come out and they say that their testosterone doses are 400 a week. And then there's, you know, video recordings of Nasser saying that he's used upwards of 5,000 milligrams yeah. of testosterone yeah. a week. There's quite a bit of disparity as to the question of how much test or how much anabolics in total mm -hmm. does it actually take to build that kind of size, uh, like genetics permitting, obviously. Yeah. yeah. What's your take on all that? Man, it's that's it's a great question because you see so many different use cases. You see, for example, John Jewett, who doesn't run much beyond 1500 milligrams max doses, even as he approaches the show or in his depths of his off season. And then you see individuals like Chase Irons, who you know ran an ex exorbitantly high amount of androgens um, and and growth hormones. So like, I think it was at total that six grams of androgens and then eighteen mm -hmm. units of growth hormone from Sterostim yeah. mm -hmm. daily, and that seemed to have get him, got him results that like he never achieved. And then he reached a, a whole new level, like some he grew to a different kind of person i've never seen before but in the same case you have someone like chris bumpson and obviously we're taking his word here where his first cycle was just a little bit of anivar when he was finishing up high school and the dude was like already bigger than everybody ever and winning most shows he was stepping on right so it's like the disparity is so large but there it like more drugs do work it's just like at what cost do they work so if I use two grams of testosterone, I'm certainly going to get bigger or at least have non-genomic effects of getting bigger, like more fullness, nitrogen retention, et cetera. But at the cost of my hair, of my skin health, of oxidative stress, you know, all those different things, ultimately coming down to a earlier death in life, realistically. Um, whereas if I could use a moderate dose and grow linearly over time, I might experience the same results with a lengthened career, but not get there as fast. So yeah. it's hard to say, really. I, I tend to think that more is better if you can manage more is better, right? Like if you're doing your lab work, if you're doing your your organ imaging, if you're doing the prerequisites to being like a, a responsible um, a user and adult, I think it's it's going to show you, can I handle more? And if I can, then let's just leverage a little bit more. Um, until you see that that degradation of health and it's like okay that's my that's my limit like i'm gonna start low work my way up every cycle and then come back down and then just keep repeating that and that's yeah. generally how i postulate things exactly and so there is that temptation of guys when they start hearing these doses i mean i imagine that's one of the main reasons why the 
what doses do the pros really take those kinds oh, of yeah. videos i know paul has made like probably six or like yeah, half a dozen maybe a dozen videos yeah. on that exact topic mm -hmm. and what what the biggest issue i think is is that once you're into that dosage range you're kind of in the devil's circle if you want to yeah. keep pushing and you have already decided like you know maybe you're 200 pounds and you go straight to a three gram cycle <laughs> you don't have a lot more room left my my man i mean if you want to push like 250 you're trying to be like hunter labrada or something mm -hmm. what are you going to do five grams six grams seven Right. At a certain point, it's not even an issue of, oh, I'm going to lose my hair or I'm going to go infertile. It's your heart's going to give out. There's right. no amount of ancillaries that's really going to protect you from from doses like that. 100%. It's, it's a big concern, especially um, though it is true that a lot of guys are using bigger doses. One natural question that comes up for me is let's assume that I'm a professional bodybuilder. This is my life. I've given my life to this thing. I'm standing on stage next to guys who are taking big doses too. We're all, you know, open division guys. Let's say that I'm John Jewett and I'm taking 1500 and I'm, I'm doing my debut for the open and I really want to do well. If John wanted to win, 100% wants to win and he knows that more milligrams will give him more muscle mass without ruining his look, right? The end goal is to, to produce a product that the judges are going to pick as first place. Right. Why would he not take more? That's the devil's advocate question. I always wonder about that. Yeah, it's a tough one, right? And I think, honestly, I think that's the value of a coach because they're like, whoa, dude, like slow yourself down. Like, yeah. you know, this like 500 milligrams of trend isn't going to help you look any harder than 150 milligrams. But yeah, spot on. I, like, there is that little bit of like that touch of psychosis that you get to when you're, you're at a goal post, like you're looking at it, but you haven't quite yet touched it. And you're like, wow, I can reach my hand out and touch this thing. But you want to like ensure you touch it because you've been working so fucking hard for this thing. So you like punch your fucking fist through the goalpost and like it just all falls down. Yeah. That's the problem, right? And, and I think ultimately that's what leads. And this is where things get so diluted, right? There's so many things I could talk about here because when you're that lean, you already look so good. And then you eat a little bit more food and then you look really fucking good. And so is it the drugs that makes the individual look good? And they think that correlation was me looking better because I took more or was it me looking better because I ate an appropriate amount of food and I peaked myself appropriately. Yeah. And, and so they take that into the off season one way or another. And if it's the higher dose guy, it's like the doses made me look the way I did on stage and likely he's going to continue to run those kind of doses for the rest of his career because they have that one positive experience. I, I would imagine that, people are probably running more than they are not. And I think we're hearing all too often about like these retrograde low dosers who are like, oh, dude, I only do 250 milligrams. And that's like how I got here and, and what have you. And, and I think maybe there is some really rare specimens out there, but they are very, very far and few between. And their, their genetic capabilities would outweigh almost anyone's in this earth. Like if you just lined them up right so i i think more often than not we're likely experiencing dudes who are using a lot and just maybe saying they aren't or likely only telling us half of the thing right it's like one of the things who i did for the longest time was like yeah i only ran like 1500 milligrams and then like when it's he started really breaking it down he's like well 1500 milligrams of testosterone and then it was like <laughs> then there's the Whoa, you know, okay yeah like then there's the insulin, then there's the growth hormone, then there's the IGF one. And so it really does have this compiling effect of like, what is the individual taking total and how is that affecting them systemically? For myself, one thing that I know for sure is like androgens don't have a, a really impressive effect on my physique. They, I grow slowly over time and make architectural changes. I get a little bit stronger, but what really makes a, a physical change almost immediately and a prolonged change is high dose growth hormone. And, and so I postulate that maybe me as an individual has less of an androgen receptor density and more of an IGF-1 receptor density. So I can accept more growth hormone and then thus IGF-1 than I can androgens getting more of an effect. And I imagine everyone's sort of on a continuum there. They have really great response, really poor response to all these different compounds. Um, so, you know, one guy who does use 500 milligrams only could also be using 20 IUs of in, uh, growth hormone. And, and we don't even like, you know, he hasn't mentioned that. So 
that's also a use case where I'm like, that's a little, that's a lot of fucking growth. I want to be running for eight years of your life, you know? Yeah. It's super multifactorial. And you'll see that even with food or training, there's certain oh, yeah. training styles that guys will just absolutely explode on out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, quick question on what you just said. Have you tried using L carnitine to increase your androgen receptor density? Do you see I a have, big difference? I super dose the shit of chase irons hooks me the fuck up with that. So like I, I yeah, just I use it super liberally. Um, I do 6,000 or 600 to a thousand milligrams a day. Okay. Um, I've personally, again, I've grown and I've made a lot of pro like I used to be 170 pounds. I'm 200 and like 40 ish now pretty lean and I'm, I'm, I'm making progress, but I don't know if it's how tangible is the effect of L, L carnitine. Is it like 10%, 20%? It's really hard to say, you know, because yeah. I've, I've used it for so long. Like I've used it for five years straight now, pretty much daily. So it's a little skewed as to what has worked and what hasn't. Right, because there's so many other variables in the mix, obviously. Yeah. As for the the other points that you touched on, the dosing issue, I think, is is so entrenched in this industry. And mm -hmm. a lot of it does come from the guys who are older or the older generation. During the time that they were coming up in bodybuilding, not only were steroids recently made illegal, but they were also a very taboo topic. It's only been the last couple decades, decade by decade, it's opening up a little bit more and more and the community is talking about it a little bit more and more there's a little bit more honesty and so these guys are being forced to take that step forward where it's like okay everyone knows that i was not natural so i guess i have to tell them that i took something but let's not talk about what i actually took let's just say you know i used i used 100 milligrams a week let's say that i'm arnold right mm -hmm. i only used 100 and that's all i needed or like you know i only take one pill of d ball a day and that's all i yeah. needed and and then there's more pressure, I think, in the coming years where guys are saying, that's obviously not the case. Let's not paint an unrealistic expectation here. Let's talk about what's actually going on. And so these newer generations of bodybuilders are being honest and open with their dosages. John mm -hmm. Jewett is a great example. He obviously has phenomenal genetics and is a freak by all stretches of the imagination. But with that being said, he's open. He talks about the things that he's using, everything yeah. from insulin to growth hormone. He's not hiding anything, really. He does the same with uh, Renee, his wife, mm -hmm. and I'm optimistic that the next generation, as in all of the all of the kids like about my age or a little bit younger, as they start breaking their way into the bodybuilding ranks, they can set that expectation in a healthier way for all of the young guys that are looking up to them. But it's a really delicate issue. I talked about this with uh, the the lead doc at Merrick. Um, it's Alpha Optimization or Atlas Optimization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we had a really good conversation about should Sam Sulik be open about his gear, about his gear use. He has hundreds of thousands, probably millions across all platforms yeah. of people watching him. Is that a door that he wants to open? Is there a net benefit or a net damage to society by him doing that? That's the big question. Right. Right. And like his income is also jeopardized by that. Right. Because not only is he potentially enabling because I mean, our, he has fucking nine posts on Instagram and 1.6 million followers. So like this, this guy posts, you know, a 10th one saying, this is the cycle I'm on. This is what I'm doing. Now he's, he's potentially enabling these 1 million or so people. And also his income with hostile being, I'm sure hostile probably wouldn't care, but whatever else he has going on, not to, in, to mention his his family system is probably all aware of the videos he's posting by now and very in tune with his content. So does him posting that cycle cost him money, cost him, you know, a, an uneasy mind, the thing you have all the millions of people he potentially enabled to use steroids and also cause dramatic uh, ties in his family that that he doesn't want to deal with? So there's, there's likely a lot to that story. I think it's unfortunate because everyone would like to know, like, what is this dude running? But at the end of the day, I don't think we're ever going to know. It's probably going to be one of those situations where he's like, yeah, I'm on stuff, but like, we won't hear what stuff is for years to come, years to come. And I don't think, you know, he owes anyone that, but it is interesting nonetheless to be like, well, it'd be nice to know, you know? Yeah, no, that's true. It, it is cool to talk to people who are natural and who do follow Sam and they they really look up to him. I think at this point, everyone knows that he's on stuff. He could come out and say that he's using anabolics or whatever, but not actually bring up numbers. It's pretty clear that he has an enhanced physique. I, I sure hope that people don't think they can look like that naturally. That would yeah. be a level of delusion I hope is not pre prevalent among my age group. But 
with that being said, I don't, I don't think a lot of these natural guys, even if he did say, Hey, I'm using this, I'm using that. I don't think a lot of them would try to copy it, but there are guys that are getting serious about lifting. They're starting to think, Oh, like what if I want to follow in his footsteps on social media? They start looking at gear as, is this my ticket to success? Like all yeah. I have to do is take this, get on this cycle. Now I'm really going to blow up. Now I'm really going to get famous. And then there's a trade-off there that you're making, but you don't actually know how much muscle you're going to gain. You don't know if you're really going to break into the Sam Sulek size category, essentially. Right. right. I'm, I'm curious now that we, we kind of went down that path, what, because you're obviously like your whole content is basically around education on the usage of compounds or whether it's look maxing, performance enhancing drugs yeah. or like whatever the case is, right? What has your close circle family or whatever thought of your situation? Like close friends from high school, teachers that you're currently maybe talking to. I don't know. Like what is there people around you that are like, dude, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. So it's it's an interesting dynamic. So it, I think the, the first hard conversation I had to have was with my mom yeah. um, where it's like, hey, it seems like you're saying that you're on stuff like what's going on here. And then you have the conversation of like, hey, listen, my whole thing is about how to do it safely. If there's anyone that could use it and not get hurt, I would probably be up there in that list. Mm -hmm. And so I, I explain the situation to her and she takes it very well. It's just like, hey, bottom line, just be safe, take care of your health, which is pretty much the protocol anyway. My dad, similar situation, but he kind of just looked at it and thought it was funny. Like the idea of <laughs> using steroids is humorous to him. Yeah. Um, regardless, like they're still proud of the physique that I've built and kind of what's going on for me on social media, uh, fam, like family and friends, the, fr my friends love it. I, I go to a, um, I go to university here in Colorado and my fraternity has been eating it up. Uh, they That's actually fun. really like that. One of my sponsors sells to Dalafil. And so it's become a little bit <laughs> popular, uh, <laughs> among some of the Greek houses here to yeah. be using that for, uh, it's intended purpose or otherwise. Um, yeah. <laughs> They, they tell me stories about like how they'll be trying to go to bed and then they get like slamming on their door. They're like, yo, bro, like, do you have an extra bottle? Please, I got a girl in my room. <laughs> it, it's hilarious. hilarious stuff, man. So, th you know, they've been enjoying like getting my discount codes on, on stuff like that. Um, and then some of them will ask me like, hey, do you think like I could do steroids or whatever? I'm like, listen, man, you don't go to the gym off as often as you drink. Like you drink seven yeah. days a week. You go to the gym like three days a week. It's probably not the move for you. And I can be honest with them and tell, tell them that and they'll take my word for it. So it's, it's really cool to see among the next generation that steroids are a bit of a gray area. Mm -hmm. But now that we look at society as with all these HRT clinics popping up and peptides becoming more and more implemented into our daily lives, yeah. everyone is going to be a biohacker in one way or another. And whether that's biohacking on a simple level of you take a vitamin D pill every day or, you know, you do like three different peptide injections, you go to an IV clinic and whatever that is, we're all headed to, in that direction. And to be able to see it normalized and to be able to see people just look at it for what it is and not really get their stigmas wrapped up around it, it's wow. kind of uplifting. So I've been enjoying it. Yeah, um, I'm, that's it's super exciting, man, because like you're honestly in, in a situation that, you know, you have the audience, you have the potential to move people in the right directions while also showing them like a glimmer of what it's like to be enhanced in some situation, right? Whether that is in the gym or elsewhere, which I think is really useful. It's good. And if people don't have the knowledge, I think likely they go down the wrong route much faster. They might still tiptoe in it, but they know, oh, that's right. Tanner told me this. This would happen. I'm a fucking idiot. Like, let's go back. No. And, and they have that sort of reassurance, which is really cool. It's interesting to me because I came from a situation where my family's not close. Like I, I'm adopted, like everything's so I've never had an issue with being myself and, you know, getting fucking tattoos everywhere and none of this stuff because I've owned my own business since as long as I can remember as since I got out of the military and I've not had my own family. And I'm always curious on like how people consider talking of me when they they're not around me that I aren't <laughs> in the bodybuilding scene, you know. Oh my God, don't follow him. All he talks about is steroids. And then I thought like, man, this kid's in college. He's, he's got a family. He's like doing things and they probably get to hear about this stuff a lot too. So it's an interesting dynamic because what's, what's fun about it is of other countries really don't give a shit, right? Like 
I was yeah. just in Thailand. You can just go to any pharmacy and buy whatever you want. Like literally exactly. any androgen is in the pharmacy. Mm -hmm. um, you can, and we're going to Bosnia in about a week's time. You can go to Bosnia into any pharmacy and get whatever you need there as well. Um, South Africa, same thing. Like Canada, it's legal to own, illegal to sell, but that's, a, you know, you're still legally able to have and use. Um, it's, it's really an interesting situation because I think almost every population within the world by now has an understanding that this stuff is systemically used. It's not damaging or addicting. Maybe in some use cases it is, but addicting for the most part if it's used appropriately and they're just like, okay, like you are in control of your health and you do it. But in America, we have that sort of taboo that's still lingering back from like the nineties ish era where the, the thought of steroids was like greasy, ugly, gross, and like, it's going to kill you kind of thing. So it, it's in, in a lot of the family members that you or I would have would be in that sort of generational period where they're like, Oh no, like he's using steroids, you know? Yeah. But in, in Thailand, like you go into the pharmacy and people are just like laughing, like, what kind of testosterone do you want? Like testoviron or, you know, a baroremobolin or like, what do you want? You know, and it's, it's an interesting dynamic for sure. Yeah, it is. It is cool. And actually when you bring it up, like wondering what people might be saying about my content behind my backs, it's, it's a funny thought because I didn't really mm -hmm. think about it till now. Uh, you know, the Instagram account that I use currently is still the one that I had when I was in high school. It used to be my oh, no just normal personal account. I didn't make a new one. Yeah. I just, decided one day to start posting pictures of myself like in down lighting with my shirt off and no one really said anything so and then eventually you know you start posting reels about steroids and people are like huh like i didn't realize this kid does this like i can imagine stuff like that yeah. you'll get the occasional comment from someone that you went to high school with or the dm like hey bro like can you give me some tips like i'm getting into the yep. gym now <laughs> those are those are always funny to see um, I don't think that there's that much of a, a negative force around it, but again, it's going to be different from, from family to family. Uh, another, uh, category of people we didn't talk about is relationships, yeah. uh, where if a lot of guys, they're, you know, they're super serious about getting enhanced. They love bodybuilding. They're like, okay, I think I want to do this. And you start talking to your girl about it. And she's like, absolutely not. Like, why would I ever let you do that? You can have all the conversations you want with this person, right. but that might not change their mind. That's just on like a seeing eye to eye on the same issue and then you get into the hey you actually get on gear you're going to start feeling different about this person mm. how is that going to adjust your relationship with this other person i know my personal experience when i first got on steroids it was a nightmare i yeah. <laughs> i was all over the place uh and thankfully i figured out how to control my hormones so that doesn't happen anymore but i warn guys i'm like hey listen there's more than just the physical side effects relationally there's a ton that you have to be aware of yeah and and by extension that individual's family as well right um, yeah yeah it's like they're going to find your content and see this stuff and it's like at a certain point you you reach that crossroads where it's like what are you doing right like you're talking about testosterone and trend and all these things and i'm a little bit concerned is your husband slash boyfriend using compounds right now or like drugs you know and it's like uh yeah and it's like it's a weird conversation to have and i just had to have it right like my significant other mom like stalks me on instagram she looks through all my content oh, yeah. and she like uh came to to watch our cat while we were in thailand and she's she's like a native of, of bosnia right so that all a balkan country like all our family speaks very broken english like they sound very russian and speak very few english words uh -huh. so she obviously comes here and my fridge is full with like growth hormone insulin and like the table i'm on right now has vials everywhere right so i look like a fucking drug addict and yeah. i don't intend to and i'm certainly not one to act like it but she uh she made this joke we were on the way home from the the airport and she we we're talking about bodybuilders or something and she brought up like how um ohana brought it up because i brought a ton of drugs home from thailand like i just put them all in my checked bag and, yeah, flew yeah. home. <laughs> and um she was like yeah you're totally natural now and her mom was like natural fuck yeah i like just laughed right and so she took it nicely thankfully right there's yeah but i could see in so many ways where like, let's say you have a really really religious parent and mm -hmm. you're that person's significant other and they see this content and then like jesus didn't make us to to pin fucking gear and then you're in the shitter and like your reputation is already burnt so it's it's an interesting situation because bringing it back to sam Zolik, like maybe there is that someone in his life or was someone in his life and now that's an issue um yeah. maybe why he's not bringing it up but 
It, it's uh, cool that you mentioned the the religion one because I actually recently had this conversation with one of my good friends. I mean, he's totally natural. He's very openly Christian. And then I'm also Christian myself. And he and I talked about Derek Lunsford, who is one of the most yeah. amazing bodybuilders of all time. And he is very a religious. very, very deeply religious person. And so that brings up the question of like, wow, like I wonder how your own personal morals and ideals will all interact with when you decide to get enhanced. You know, it's not like a, it's not like you're taking creatine. There's a lot more social stigma and belief systems that can interfere with and interact with uh, yeah. using enhancements without a doubt. Yeah, yeah. But by extension, it's it's a you know cardinal sin essentially in, in Christianity to like inject compounds into you by some like some people believe this right by what the, the Bible has to say. Um, the Muslim religion is very opposite. Like they don't give a fuck as long as you're nice to other people and you genuinely care. It's like whatever, dude. Pin gear. Um, so it's it's a very abstract situation. I'm curious though, now that we're on the line of like your relationships, yeah, enough and stuff. What yeah, yeah. is like what have you currently been running? Because I don't, I see a lot about like what you advise other people to do in educational content, but I've actually don't know like what you're running or have ran or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll give you the brief history because I mean there's not much of it. I, I did my first cycle it was test only. I added a little Anavar in at the end of it, a little MK. And then unfortunately was not fully prepared for how bad the MK was going to mess up my blood glucose. Mm. So got a little bit fat and flat at the end of that one. <laughs> so it was more like damage control after that cycle. So cruising for a little bit. Um, there was uh, after as, as I was cruising, I was experimenting with different compounds in like little micro doses on my cruise because yeah. I was interested to see what would be the right compound for me on this next growing cycle, whatever that might be, whenever I'm ready for that that next growing cycle. Um, I had a coach brought in at one point. He and I weren't a good fit, but he put me on DECA and Mastron. Learned the hard way that DECA is one of the most nightmarish compounds for me ever. My uh, my Johnson did not work and I felt horrible 24-7. Yeah. And because of the you know two and a half months that it takes for it to clear out of my body, I wasn't exactly a happy camper for a bit of time there. But after that, I made the switch to testosterone and boldenone. I'm using boldenone sipionate and a little tiny sprinkle of Tren in there. Um, we, I think we actually had a, an Instagram live stream about this where we talked about a uh, microdosing trend for kind yeah. of like a CEO mindset. Mm -hmm. So you and I see eye to eye on that where there's a really nice little edge that you get in your professional oh, yeah. business work that just a tiny little touch of, of trend actually helps with. So the doses right now, 300 milligrams testosterone and anthate, 150 bold and unsipionate, and then trend balone and anthate that's 75 per week. Wow. That's actually a lot more modest than I was expecting to hear, man. Yeah. Yeah. And then I use three, three units of growth hormone every night before I go to bed. So that's also helping. What's, what's your weight at right now? 180. Okay. So yeah. where did you start? Like before you even got started into any compound usage, like what was your body weight at that point? Like peak natural 155 yeah. pounds. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So you made a substantial amount of weight gain. Yeah. And it's been in a pretty short amount of time too. I was, I was 155, I think six months ago. So no something like that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Up, dude. So what is your intention? Like, where do you see yourself going with all this? Yeah, it, it's really interesting. The way that I got into into using gear was I saw Ronnie Coleman for the first time and I was blown away. And my immediate thought was like, what do I have to take to look like that? <laughs> yeah. And this was like coming from I was 125 pounds, never oh, touched God. a dumbbell in my life. <laughs> and um, and my roommate at the time was like kind of a big bodybuilder. He was just watching like the 98 Olympia or the 99 Olympia or something like that. I saw him hit that Atlas pose where he like expands his arms like that. His traps yeah. are gigantic. So I immediately started researching gear. Like basically the same day I started <laughs> like lifting weights. It's a very unorthodox story. Yeah. So from that point on, it's just, you know, been a little chemist. And, and then the goal, the end goal is like, just how much muscle can I absolutely slap onto my frame and yeah. see what happens? But then again, the, the answer is like within reason. Right. So there could be a point at which like I'm cranking Dallas McCarver style cycles. Do I see it getting to that point? Very unlikely. I need to be respectful to my body. And then that's also something that's like kind of true of my faith where like, yeah. I, I need to be very respectful of what I've been given. Right. And that includes not thrashing my health. <laughs> yeah. 100%. What, so like, is there a cap to that, right? Let's say like you, you infinitely are able to, to grow at moderate to low doses and you get up to like, how tall are you? I'm five foot nine. Okay. So let's say you get up to like 260, right? And you're like one of those like truly big motherfuckers. Like, is that actually where you want to be? Like that big? Or are you talking more maybe like a, 
a still aesthetically pleasing physique where it's like that dude's fucking huge, but he's also really sexy. Yeah. So it's interesting. It's especially my age demographic. They care a ton about aesthetics, like mm -hmm. those really streamlined physiques, like really like, you know, nicely sculpted, all of that. Yeah. I just want to be like gigantic and disgusting. Really? Like I kind of want to walk past like a group of kids and then like to freak out and get scared. <laughs> yeah. Like, like it, it's hilarious, but you know, physiques like Nick Walker, I love that. Uh, oh, shit, Derek Lunsford, love that look. Uh, and I, I've been super into professional bodybuilding ever since I saw Ronnie Coleman. Wow. And I hear, I mean, especially the older guys, they talk to me, they're like, dang, like, why do you like bodybuilding so much? Like all, all these kids, your, your age, they just care about like Alex Eubank and yeah. you know, David Laid, those guys. Right. Dude, that's so cool to hear. I didn't, I didn't actually expect that response. It's a, it's a pretty unique desire to be like that, you know. Yeah. It, it's, it's one. It's hard. It's almost nearly impossible to. Achieve. Yeah, I'm not betting on getting there, but there's a chance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what? This is an interesting pose, right? Because you have talked about look maxing and stuff, and I think this is along the same lines. Let's say you do get that big. Like, are yeah. you concerned? And I don't know if you have a significant other right now, but are you concerned that the significant other you may or may not have in that future moment would find that appealing or unappealing? Or would you selectively find one based on her ability to prefer someone that's so it? It's kind of within that realm where I've learned as I got on gear and have been around this community. It's like, OK, I think, you know, I'm a little bit partial to the girls who are using a little bit of Anavar. Oh, I don't yeah. don't exactly yeah. mind that. And so I think one of the guys, especially when you talk about looks maxing, one of the guys who I look up to could be Regan Grimes, where mm -hmm. he's built an insane amount of size, freaky, disgusting. He's like probably almost into his 30s now, but by all stretches of the imagination, Very by attractive. society yeah. standards, he's a good looking guy. Exactly. Yeah. He works with Father Sons, that one brand that cares a lot about like how you dress, your style, your fashion. He takes care of his appearances. His acne is non-existent. There's no scarring on him. He's a very clean, very polished physique, despite being, you know, probably 300 pounds in his off season easily. Right. 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 So there's there's room for it. Is it tricky to get there and to find that balance? Absolutely. Especially because I'm five nine. I'm not going to have as streamlined as a physique that he is. Right. He's quite a bit taller than me, but you can find that middle ground. So now this, dude, there's a million other things I want to talk about now. So <laughs> girls on Anavar, right? Like <laughs> it's funny you say that because it's such a weird thing that when you are in this realm that's like one of the qualifying factors to a significant other almost why do you think that is it the like neurochemical change from using ourselves that is like perceivably we want whatever that is like the potentially like the the uh, uh smells or the endorphins coming from or not the endorphins but the uh pheromones coming from yeah, this yeah. other individual from having higher androgens or yeah. is there something that in your mind you think well this is why this person might be a little bit more appealing or is it just because preferentially they're willing to risk a little bit more for the same sort of thing you are so i've seen kind of two camps with guys maybe you've noticed something different but in my groups of friends i find that the guys especially in bodybuilding they seem to fall either into one or the other one being they like the girls that are muscular, they're really built, like they're probably on stuff, the, the kind of physique that they're looking for. Yeah. And their type leans towards that side, super muscular, whether that's like more wellness or they like the super, super conditioned, like super shredded bikini girls with like gigantic delts. And then the other side of it is like, I don't really care if she lifts, like I don't even really want her to lift. Like that's I just true. want her to be like a normal girl. Then I have a lot of friends that are like that. They kind of want them like petite, like small. I think there might even not that I'm going to put this on my buddies who think this way, but there might be a little bit of an ego kick out of like, yeah, like she's small, like she makes me look gigantic, like by yeah. comparison, <laughs> yeah. helps the body dysmorphia a little bit. Yeah, it makes you feel better. Right. Uh, so is this something you see, for instance, the guys who are looking for or seeking more of like the muscular aesthetic out of a female? Is that something you see them wanting before they get on enhancements? Or is that something that? You know what oh, I mean? Interesting. Yeah. No, now that I'm, I got to think about it. Um, I don't know. I don't think I've talked to my buddies enough about it. I can speak like from my own experience. Like I definitely, I didn't like girls super skinny, but I, I you know, I'm not chasing the BBW either. Yeah. And, and just like, I like that they had like some good size to them. Um, and then now I'm getting into it and it's like, wow, like I didn't realize that if a girl builds a certain amount of muscle, like the, the kind of girls that I would like uh, back, but when I was natural, was like they played soccer. So yeah, it's like, oh, yeah. like they have pretty developed legs. Like you can see the quad definition a little bit from the side, even with like relatively average body fat percentages. Mm -hmm. And then you throw in a little bit of enhancements and you're like, 
dang, I actually did not know that women could look like that. And you kind of yeah. get into this enhanced world of now your standards are creeping up a little bit. <laughs> by yeah. the day. You don't realize it until it, until, you know, you're neck deep in it. But yeah, and then you're looking for like a fucking walking horse, essentially with a wellness girl. Yeah, with the, yeah it's that's a different <laughs> level. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's that's funny, dude. It's I think there there is something like I don't know what it would be, but there's definitely something tied in because I was like I won my natural pro card in bodybuilding, and my preferences were so much different back then. And really, wow, like so much different. And I don't know if it was necessarily again the maturation of myself, or was it the forceful maturation in a sense from androgens being deployed at some point along that timeline. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thought. Um. So you with, notice that with like uh, birth control in women too, where, you know, yeah. when they, they get on birth control, their types in, in men will change. I got a buddy who like, you know, he'll get on NPP and he'll fall in love with some girl and then he comes off the NPP <laughs> and cha changes his mind completely. Yeah. Yeah. That's so funny. It's kind of like this trend stories you hear with like, oh. <laughs> trend made me gay. <laughs> but yeah, then the sexuality changes and they're yeah. all over the place, man. Yeah. Like that's it a nightmare. <laughs> it's crazy, dude. I, I think there's like, especially the 19 Norse, like the 19 Norse have some unique effects with the brain and it, there's 100%. hypothalamic effects but it, it, it's got to go beyond that because the wild i mean just fucking wild stories i've heard on trend or or nangelone is there's just no way that that is a chance thing right like yeah i swear eight out of ten guys who use trend get divorced like there's something <laughs> with it that does a, a a a job to your brain exactly um, when it comes to look maxing, what are maybe define that? Cause I think it's, it's a unique term that not many people outside of, I mean, maybe, I, I, maybe I might be out of the loop, but like back when I was paying attention to it, it was like very much so a forum based thing yep. with very few YouTube videos or anyone talking publicly about it via video. Yeah. Um, what is it? And like, how do you sort of max the looks? Like what would you do? Right. So it's definitely a generational term. I think a, a lot of guys probably in their 30s, 40s, 50s probably have no idea what this is or like that that term. Um, I think back then they would call it PSL or something like that. Yeah. Um, and so I was not really involved with the forums then. Nowadays, the basic, the basic way, if you boil it down to it, is improve your appearance, your presence as a man. That could even extend to how you carry yourself, all of these things to basically make you a better person. Mm -hmm. So... In one side of it, it's really healthy as in like, yeah, you should be taking care of yourself. You should take care of your hygiene and make sure that you are cleanly and your surroundings are well kept. You should smell good. You should act kind to other people or, you know, maintain a, whatever persona works best for you. And then the other side of it is you get obsessed to the point of body dysmorphia with your looks. And that can be a really unhealthy little uh, rabbit hole to fall down where you're very insecure about how you look all the time. You're like, I don't know if I have the genetics to be attractive. I can only do this. I can only do that. But at the end of the day, it's just doing the best that you can. Bodybuilding is kind of the same way. That yeah. That's basically how I would sum up looks maxing, essentially. What is now, is there, because again, I know of some pharmacological practices to enhance look. You've spoke about some. Melanotan yeah. is a great example, um, you know, I've even seen low dose Accutane to improve skin texture, different things, um, topical application of uh, different hair growth um, profiles to, to get like beard growth even, right? Yep. So is there things that you kind of picked up on or you think that actually have application within that realm? Yeah, so it was an interesting thing that happened kind of recently, was maybe like a, two months ago, where looks maxing broke back onto the scene rapidly uh, on TikTok, it, it gained a ton of a ton of viral attention. And it's kind of convenient that it happened on TikTok, which is a relatively younger audience, because then you can take the most advantage of things like mewing, where, you know, you are practicing proper breathing, make sure that's purely through your nose, your tongue posture is correct, and that will help accentuate your jawline. And as looks maxing goes, you want a stronger jawline, you want to lose body fat, and all of these things are pushing a man towards a healthier lifestyle. To a, to a limit, obviously. You don't mm -hmm. want to be totally emaciated. And so then we take the next step into pharmacological interventions because some guys will say, well, I have like a baby face and, and you know, I'm, I'm 22, I'm way out of puberty, what's going on? I don't know, like, can I masculinize myself in some way? I want to look more manly. Well, then there, that rings up the question of, 
are there things that we can bring in to increase your testosterone that might over time, because again, puberty is like, you know, five, six, seven year process, right. or even a small, the small amount of androgens that your body is producing is enough to masculinize you. So if you're increasing your androgens even more, either during that time period where your body is super sensitive to change, or you're doing it a little bit after that, which might involve a little bit more androgens, kind of why a lot of bodybuilders have these caveman like faces, mm -hmm. then, um, that's where there is possibility to almost change your face shape, change your face structure. There's, there's also a limit there. There's bodybuilders who use so much growth hormone that they start to develop these elf ears. Their yeah. ears will get bigger. Their noses will get bigger. Yeah. I mean, there's also, you know, Mike Isratel, people talk about the horns that he has on his head. There's limits to these things. And so it's funny when you bring up the, the bodybuilder prospects for myself, it's like, yeah, if I do start pushing the doses pretty high, I might start looking more like Frankenstein than, you know, yeah. like, like an attractive man. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a, I think what you said there is important too. And I, and generally I think people like to label things as almost like a, a, a way of uh, dignifying them in some sense or, or making them a practice, but look maxing is relatively just being a healthy and uh, well thought out man. Yeah. You know, someone who who actually does take a shower, shave, and and get like a nice haircut in a while, and make sure their skin complexion is not completely fucked, and clean up after themselves, and like don't just have fucking piles of pop by the PC and whatever. I think that's more of what it is than anything else. And I do think there's a pretty useful pharma pharmacology that can be applied, like you mentioned, especially with androgens. One thing that I noticed actually, and and people can go back on my YouTube channel to the very first YouTube videos I've made where that was like post uh, or pre me winning my pro card at bodybuilding. And you can hear lots of things that are different. My voice sounds way different. Like it's yeah. super light. It's super geeky and nerdy. My jawline is not even close to where it is. And like my face structure look much, it looked like I was emaciated. Like you kind of mentioned, like my cheeks were really sunken in, even though I wasn't on prep and, it was kind of an interesting dimensional shift for me when I was looking at this video and I was also looking at, you know, a more recent one and I'm seeing these changes in myself. And um, I, I think there's positives and negatives, obviously like the longer you're on androgens, I think the longer um, the exposure, the more morphological changes you'll experience. But for yep. someone who has weak facial features and even like facial hair, for example, a small dose of TRT plus some could actually be really efficacious. Now, some people do claim that trenbolone can usually cause a greater uh, pronunciation of the jaw or masculinizing effects. I don't know if you've seen this in like forum posts and stuff in the past. Um, do you think that's even plausible? Like, do you think, let's say someone wants to have that pronounced jaw, a bit of a tighter sort of look, and in general, like that squared off Chad looking thing, <laughs> would, would trend be the answer to that? Maybe they do like a very low dose testosterone protocol and then implement trend at 75 to hundred milligrams. So there's an interesting, uh, case where I was just, I was just listening to a podcast, the uh, Leo, Leo longevity, Ariella mm -hmm. Palumbo and Boston Lloyd, they were talking about trend in females. And he was saying how even like low dose trend that some females would be trying to use in their shows, not endorsing that obviously, yeah. but they start to develop this like weird, uh, yeah, the, like, the pouch. lump here, almost like yeah. a, a Turkey, like the gobble that they have there. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was saying that he's also seen that in men. And so you might develop a sharper jawline, but whatever the development of this like patch of fat or, or water retention or whatever it might be there mm -hmm. might be a net loss in terms of your look maxing uh, progress. So I would discourage any prospective looks maxers from trying to take advantage of trend <laughs> for that purpose. You'll probably see incredible results, just like what Colton was talking about with the just the testosterone you used. Yeah. You know, you can pull up videos and pictures of yourself from like even just me from before I did my first cycle. Like, wow, I basically look like I didn't go through puberty and I was 23 years old. <laughs> yeah, and then now yeah. it's like, OK, I'm starting to look my age. This is pretty good. It's pretty nice. Right, right. What are your thoughts? I, and I don't even know if you've looked into something like this, but like Botox or local sort of um, nerve toxins to improve like skin texture and also like rip, rippling of skin. Yeah. So I'm a little bit familiar with it because I mean, I, I've always been doing a ton of research. And then uh, there was a, a girl that I was seeing at the time who was getting Botox in her forehead and kind of around her eyebrows because she was getting migraines. 
And, you know, I was reading through things a little bit to make sure, like, is this actually safe? And you find all the studies about how horribly toxic Botox is and you want to yeah. freak out for a second. But then you realize, oh, wait, it's not actually, you know, readily right. absorbed by the body. And it's not in. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's there's applications there. But with anything, it's a little bit of a don't go to excess because you'll see a lot of guys that do get yeah. work done on their faces and you can see that abnormal smoothness in their skin which very easily could have been achieved by i don't know eliminate your micronutrient deficiencies maybe yeah. leverage a little bit of growth hormone i don't know if you get the same magic but when i brought in growth hormone like my skin just kind oh, of got yeah. this glow to it mm -hmm. yeah yeah really really like that benefit of it so minor interventions like that could probably give you the results that you're looking for instead of getting heavy-handed with the more cosmetic surgery related things yeah 100 yeah, percent. there's a lot of guys that think like you were talking about like lowering your body fat being one of the, the prominent things you can do to improve even facial features. Yep. And I've seen lots of men, if you, and you can just look this up yourself, like buccal fat pad removal. It's like where essentially they remove yeah. the fat pads within your cheek, right? And mm -hmm. a lot of men, you can look up before and afters and you look at the before and it's just like, they're just fat men. And ultimately like they're trying to get the trim jawline and then kind of like a little bit of a sunken in cheek. Yeah. But you can achieve that just by reaching a caloric deficit for an extended period of time. And usually it'll stay around for a, a pretty reasonable amount of time as provided you don't, you know, completely reverse and go off the deep end. And there's so many different surgeries like that too, that people can do or things that people can take SGLT2 inhibitors, for example, to, to seemingly get the result that they want. But ultimately it just comes down to like maybe lifestyle practice needs to be looked at overall and yeah. like you said, micronutrient deficiencies, like two birds with one stone, caloric deficit, micronutrient deficiencies. You've got yourself a very attractive person in a couple months. Exactly. It's really interesting that a lot of people don't exactly have their heads wrapped around this, but a healthy body is actually a beautiful body in many, many ways. Yeah. And if all you, if you, if your goal wasn't even to look good, you know, you take someone who is living like in, in complete despair and their life is a mess, and you basically just fix their diet, you fix their, you know, you give them an exercise regimen, something, anything, get them out of the house, get them some sunlight. You'll watch them start to realize, uh, maybe I'm starting to take issue with all of the bags of trash and DoorDash sitting around in my room. I don't really like that my windows and blinds are closed yeah. all the time. I want to sleep more hours. I don't like going to bed at 3 a.m. And their lifestyle just adapts to the healthy lifestyle that's already going. It can snowball forwards. But we do live in an, in an era where, like I was saying earlier, everyone is a biohacker in one way or another. Biohacking is like a supplement. It's like something to add on top or to cross a bridge to an island that you wouldn't reach otherwise. Everything else that is achievable within natural means, you could probably just do it naturally. And you don't need to be, you know, saying, hey, bro, like I'm 30% body fat. Can I use TRT to get shredded? Yeah. Ah, uh, man. There's a lot of other problems we got to deal with before that. There's levels, like there's many levels to this shit. Yeah, 100%. Well, Tanner, dude, I, I got to bounce pretty soon. I have a client call. I, I do appreciate this time, man. And I always enjoy talking to you. You have some pretty unique um, viewpoints, especially for your age, man, which I'm always <laughs> saying I'm proud of you because it's crazy yeah. how far you've uh, managed to put yourself in this world at such a young age. And you should be really excited about what's to come because I can't even imagine, man, if I would this head start, I know I'm so yeah. new to it I just I don't know what to expect it's crazy <laughs> yeah I'm proud of you man it's good so Appreciate um, I will ensure that people have the details to your account down below on Instagram is there anything else you'd like to leave with or plugs you'd like to put in before we bounce off no honestly I mean if you guys have any other questions for me I have this big document called my FAQ you guys can find that in my Instagram bio in my link tree in my TikTok. Go check that out. If you have any questions for me, usually they're probably answered there. And you can always DM me on Instagram. I get back to them usually every day. But I just had a vacation in Miami, a little bit frazzled trying to catch up on DMs, but uh, things are going well. So I hope to hear from you guys soon. Cool, cool. All right, man, I appreciate you. Yeah, likewise, brother. Uh...